Welcome. I'm Peter Tursa here today with uh, William Guardhouse. Uh, he's a successful breeder, a showman of sheep, chickens, and rabbits. And specifically, our focus today is to talk to Bill about the rabbits and uh, how he's managed to be in the winner's circle over so many years. We might even get him to share with us some tips and tricks that have helped him to be so successful, not just with the rabbits, but also his success with sheep and chickens. And we're going to take a tour of the rabbit tree. Thank you, Bill, for allowing me to meet with you here today at your farm in Schaumburg. Let's start. Uh, tell me, Bill, uh, when did you get started in the hobby of showing rabbits? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, I guess uh, my original, when I got my first rabbit was 1955. And the reason I got into rabbits was partly because I'm, I was, I'm a fourth generation farmer and my dad was showing sheep at all the fall fairs. So it, I thought, well, what a wonder, wonderful chance for me to have my own hobby. I'll show chickens and rabbits and take them to the fairs because we're going with the sheep anyway. So that got me going and dad was uh, good enough to let me tag along and, and take up his time with the rabbits. Um, yeah, then it branched out from there. I got into some, I got interested in the purebred rabbits and the shows, and uh, and it went from there. Yeah. What were the shows like in those early days? You were how old were you when you started? I was uh, eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Wow. Eleven. Wow. And how long did it take you to get your first win? <laughs> well, well, that's an interesting thing. Young people today, uh, God bless them, but they want to win right away, or even, even adults that get in. It took me four to five years before I won a first. Even so, won a first, you had loan a best in show, so. Yeah, and I, and you know something, I wasn't impatient. To, I, I, even today, if I start something, I'm not impatient to win right away. I have, maybe that's one of the reasons why I've been able to survive on the farm. I have lots of patience to do work by myself and just keep going and, uh, I don't get impatient yeah, to, to win right off the bat. I, I, okay. get, I get that from my dad, I guess. He was pretty uh, easy going that way. Yeah, and being a farmer too, it takes a lot of different skills to make oh, it, it happen. Does. Oh, it does. You have to be a little bit of everything. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to the rabbits, uh, what breeds have you raised over the years? Well, the breed I started with in 1955 actually was a New Zealand Red. I think I got it from Herb Johnson, uh, uh, and I had some, the reds were very popular back then, and then it wasn't long until I got into the New Zealand whites. I kept a few Californians and some Dutch. The reason I got the Dutch was because when I was 17, there was an encouragement for me to become a judge, and in order to be a judge, you got to keep fancy breeds and meat breeds, and, uh, and so it, it behooved me to get into the Dutch, and, and I enjoyed them. Uh, but being a farmer, uh, the meat breeds, utility breeds, uh, just made more sense to me to have something that's practical from a meat standpoint. Now, you did get your judge's license with the Dominion Rabbit and Cavey Breeders Association. Do you know about what year that happened? Uh, it would be in the, uh, about 1960, maybe. So a yeah. long time ago. You've yeah. been judging a long time. They were, the older guys were getting older and they, they wanted some young people to step up and, uh, and uh, I was extremely shy and it took me a while to adapt to it, but it was the best thing for me. And that's the one thing about maybe about rabbits and the chickens too, but especially the rabbits. It's a great developing ground for people who are shy. It really is. You get a chance to go to the club meetings and you get a chance to go out to the shows and, and you get a chance to talk. Otherwise you'd be home on the farm or home in town and you don't get that chance unless you're into that type of thing, you know. You get to meet lots of people. Yeah. You go lots of places for all the shows, well, that's for all sure. the traveling you do, yeah. all the cities you've been <laughs> yeah. in that you would have no other reason to go to. Well, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, you don't go if you're. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I've enjoyed about the rabbit hobby and showing rabbits is all the people, all the places. I agree with you 100%. That you would never go. Yeah. So, over the years, I'm sure you've been in a lot of places. Another thing I like about the rabbits and the chickens, too, you work with them all year with your hands and it's 99% it, my own efforts. So when you're loading up those rabbits or chickens and you go to a show, what a wonderful feeling that this is the result of your labor and your time with no other people involved. Like, you know, jobs today, people are, you know, they have a whole bunch of people involved in someone getting to the top, but you can do it yourself. It's a wonderful hobby to get that independence and, 
Mind you, if you lose, you got no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> but if you win, wow, it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, it does. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. That's that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And of of all the breeds that you've raised, I, I think I know the answer to this one, but I, I need to hear it from you. What's your favorite rabbit breed? Oh, the same as yours, Peter. <laughs> it's a New Zealand white. And Not just in New Zealand, the whites. Well, the white, yeah, because they've reached such, such a state of perfection. And I'm a type person. I like, I like that flow of the body, the up and over. It sounds simple, you know, you start full-bodied, up and over and down, nice full, full rear end. But it's a constant challenge to keep it that way. And when you're playing with the big boys where there's 100 and, over 100 in a class, those little things mean a lot. And uh, your, your, job's, your work's never done. There's always ways of getting better. And the quest for perfection is, all, is never reached. You have to keep going. You think a white rabbit with pink eyes, they look alike, but they're not alike once you've had them for a while. No, they're like people. They're all different yeah, in personality sure. and character and, and sure. even in their shape and everything. And only those that are in it, uh, even litter mates, they might look off a lot, but there's always a little tweak here and there, yeah, isn't for there? For sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Then as you get older, you, when I talk about patience and endure, you have to accept the fact that judges see things differently. And what I see is something that I finally made progress. Some judge might not see it. You've got you to gotta be able to accept someone else's opinion for the day. And that's something that's hard to do for a lot of people. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like it. They get upset. And what's the use, you know? But we've got to try to... It helps us to grow, actually, yeah. to raise rabbits. It, it's not just a kid's game. It's more, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's something that helps us develop as human beings and helps us uh, become more mature. It's not always about always winning. No, that's true, true, for it, sure. A loss now and then will oh, it's sharpen you up too. Yeah, you have uh, to learn to be a good winner and a good loser. And it sounds stupid to say both, but there's lots of people aren't good winners and lots, certain lots of people aren't good losers either. But that's life, isn't oh, it? it? That's true. Isn't that so? It really reflects life and it helps you. It's great for young people to get oh. into a hobby like this if they can. Oh, the rabbits are a wonderful, learn so wonderful much. developing ground for young people. I don't yeah. think the, the people know that. How, how what you know? Yeah, it's better than what they're doing now. You know, I shouldn't say that. Everything changes. Everything's technology now and everything. But yeah. it's nice to get out in that rabbit house and just, uh, yeah, just go accordingly to their animals. Now, uh, the American here in Canada, we have the Dominion Rabbit and Breeders Association, uh, DRCBA, and uh, KB's is the last one there. Uh, in the states, the American Rabbit Breeders Association has um, a big convention every year, the largest in North America. And I know that in the year 2000, you won best in show. You have the trophy behind you to, to prove it. And uh, it was in Columbus. And um, if I'm not mistaken, there was some 17,000 in the open class that year that you won. Uh, tell us a little bit how that played out at the convention. Well, that was an interesting time because Tours, I, I had a pretty good bunch of rabbits. I didn't know that they were going to, no one knows they're going to win. I mean, you, you, you'd be a fool to say that you're going to go to a convention and win at any time. But I had about 20 or 30 rabbits I showed there. And, and I got sick, terribly sick, uh, uh, the two or three days before. And I could have easily backed out. But something told me I should go. And we drove all night to get there, uh, myself and another guy. And we got there and got the rabbits in. And, oh, there was... There was 9, uh, 900, 950 New Zealands in the show. The first class was a senior doe, which was the one that won eventually. A G9P was her tattoo number. They all have to be tattooed according to my own uh, records. And G9P, she was in a class of 92. She won that. Uh, but she was second for quite a while. Bob Crawford, the famous breeder, was ahead of me. And... Um, and at the last minute, uh, the judge put mine up first and his second. And uh, afterwards, I asked the judge what, about that. And he said, well, I like that doe in second, but she had little pot marks in her coat. And he says, I, I was going to keep her second. And I thought to myself, why would I let a little cosmetic thing like that, that can, uh, why would it interfere with the best rabbit? And he was a guy, Paul Smith from California. He was a special New Zealand judge. And so he switched it, and from then on, she went on to get best New Zealand white, best of breed. And then she came into the big auditorium, and uh, uh, they narrowed it down, narrowed it down to the final four. And she was there, 
I was getting a bit nervous. I was going to say, how were you feeling at that point? I was getting a bit nervous, but actually it, it wasn't as bad as I thought because I'd, I'd been on the farm and I'd been through sheep shows and I'd been through chicken shows. I knew I could, I could take that kind of pressure. As long, my, my biggest concern was not that she won or lost, but I wanted the doe to not beat herself. And, and sometimes they get a little hyper, and, and she was a, the good ones are usually a little high strung. And I thought, oh, please, may she not climb up the judge's coat or something and ruin. But she didn't. She stayed put, and she just bang, 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 and she ended up best in show, yeah, just by the process of working through it. And afterwards, what was that like with everybody coming oh, to got, you? and I everything? got mobbed. <laughs> <laughs> I got home. I'm not much of a techie guy, and I, I had a fax machine then. There was 14 faxes when I, before I got home. And what did they want? Buy rabbits? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. A guy from California wanted everything I got. And, uh, I, my, and I found someone said, well, you got lots to sell, Bill. I didn't have enough to satisfy them. You know, they all want something ready to breed around six months, and I only have a few of them left. And baby, oh, yeah, it was, it was uh, I know I, I jokingly say sometimes success is a pain in the ass. It's a lot of work. Well, it was. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And I had to just refuse 90% of them because I didn't have enough rabbits. And this show is usually late in the fall, and by the late of the fall, you've done a big call for winter as a rule. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, so you don't have a lot yeah. of extra rabbits no, around. I At least I wouldn't in my barn. So. No, no, I didn't. And, uh, but it was, just, it was just a one, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. And I, when I got that rabbit home, five days later, she went into a molt. You wouldn't recognize her. She looked just awful, no hair. <laughs> And she never came back right, no. Wow. I read to her, and she had, she had a daughter that wasn't bad, but I never really, the don't ever really put me on the map. But it was a one-shot deal, and she was in the right place at the right time. Well, I've learned that. It's not always the winners that give you the, no, the winners. No, no, It's usually some other rabbit in the background that's no. doing the work for you. That's been my experience, yeah. No. Uh, the, um, so since that big win... How has that impacted your uh, breeding and, and, and the work in the rabbitry or showing the enthusiasm of all that? Like, that was the big win. So how has that, it's been 23 years now, how did that affect you over that time? It's a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I, if I have to keep referring to that, you know I haven't done much in the meantime. But, but no, it, it, it gave me a high for a while. I went, I went to the Michigan State Show and got... I think I won a best in show down there and a best opposite at a New Zealand National afterwards, which was great. And, and uh, I guess maybe, as I, as I mentioned to some of my friends, I said, if you really want to be stay on top, I'm trying to run a farm here, 100 acres with sheep, rabbits, chickens, and I'm on my own, basically. I, I know it sounds, but I actually would need to spend more time with the rabbits if I want to compete with the big boys consistently. I got, I got through on that one, uh, which was fine. But it, it, it made me feel, it, there's no doubt it gave me a uh, lift for a while. And, but you always have to be on the lookout for another new stud buck, because there's always, that's another thing with rabbits, and maybe why some of us hang in there. We, there's always something we need to improve. If anyone's sitting back thinking they got a rabbit that's perfect, there's no such thing. No such thing. Never has been, never will be. And it's always something you can get better. And so the breeding that produced that winner at the convention, did you, what were the litter mates like? Did you get any more? Uh, did you try that breeding again? Yeah, were you able to? Yeah. Sometimes you lose. I lost, I lost the, 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 the mother, yeah. Okay. The, do, the buck actually was a buck I got from Harry Rice. Is yeah. that right? I think yeah. you had success. I had success with something and in Harry, too. He yeah. was one that Harry, I got him. And, uh, yeah, he was, it was a good, and I knew that doe, that doe was pretty good. But, oh, God, that, that doe that won there, she went through a terrible stage when she was around five months, six months. You couldn't show her. But then she was so rough that she, when she molted, she made up for it. And she come on with this gorgeous coat. And as coat only counts, supposed to only count 15, but if it's a gorgeous coat, Boy, it means a lot when you get to a convention. Um, I, mean, I would still fault the dough for a little bit type here and there, but that coat was, wow, it snapped. Right it there. helps to have a good oh, it, coat, it, no it, doubt it about it. It not only helps, it made the day yeah. for her. If you yeah. have good type and everything yeah. else to go with it, that coat will just show it off. Oh, well, I know it did. And, uh, yeah. 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 Well, that's great. Now, I'd like to talk to you, just changing gears a little bit, to talk to you a little bit about uh, the process you go through from breeding to show day uh, let, let's talk about that a little bit let's begin with breeding 
What do you look for when you're pairing a buck and a doe? Well, it's, you know, there's, there's that old saying, you know, he's got to breed, breed, try to improve, make a breed improve, improvement for the breed by don't breed faults together. Uh, the stud buck's the main one I find. I find I get some does out there that are, I call them just baby producers, but they got good bloodlines behind them. And I, the thing is to, if, if, to get the best buck you can, uh, whether it's your own breeding or whether it's from something else, and still, you're not sure of the nickability of it, but once you do get something that nicks, you got to stay with it as long as you can. What do you mean by that? Like, well, you can breed a good one to a good one, and sometimes the babies aren't as good as the parents. You want to you want to get babies that are better than the parents if you can. So and if you find that connect works, you you stay with you that. stay with it with that yeah. buck and maybe even that same doe each time. Yeah, you stay with it, and the the worth the thing is once you people come to buy, they want to buy something. And they, want to, they want to buy some of your good ones too, which is understandable. So the hardest part is sometimes is hanging on to enough of them to accommodate me without overselling uh, to people who want them. And uh, But if I had 10 good does, I'd like to keep the best two and then sell the third and fourth best one. And you're not always sure those the best two are, go are going to breed the best, but it's a better chance of it. How long do you like to hang on to them before you make that decision of letting oh, some set them, to go? Some of them will be four or five years old maybe before you let them go yeah a real good one okay there's a doe down there now that uh, was first uh first at the at the national in columbus there a couple of years ago uh first doe out of i don't know 55 or something well she's still around and eh, she's she's only got four or five babies with her now but i'll forgive her for that if i can i want to get something to replace her before she goes and what about when you're selling, when do you make that decision of what you're willing to sell? At what age would the rabbits be, generally? Oh, I, I like to grow them out. Uh, I like to get them up to, you know, I like to get them up to four, four or five months. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can go through them as youngsters there and uh, make decisions, but sometimes they change. If you have the, you know, if I, I, gotta, I keep about 20 does down there. I like to have five or six holding pens for each doe, so there's about 120 cages there. Uh, so if you want to cover yourself, it's nice to grow them out before you make that final decision. That's not always possible because, you know, whatever reason. Yeah. Condition your rabbits when you're getting them ready for show. Well, I, I have a, I put them in my outside barn there if it's, if it's in the good weather. and. Uh, all individually penned, of course, <coughs> but so they can't urinate on one another or, or dirty one another. Um, try to feed them. I give them a, a, about 15% oats in the diet and just feed a, a, a pellet that's not too high in protein, but fairly high in, uh, in, uh, in fiber. And uh, just try to f feed them adequately, but limit feed them. So that they clean up, they clean up, or they clean up their feet every day. There's nothing worse than having those beautiful feeders in front of a, of a of an individual rabbit. Nothing worse than filling the feeder right up. You can just ruin a good New Zealand. Uh, maybe it's not so bad for some of the small breeds that uh, eat differently, but these uh, meat type rabbits, they're so good at putting meat on their frame that they'll build up and and just uh, get internal fat pretty quick. Or eat. Oh yeah. Now, when you say oats, what, uh, what kind of oats? Well, I used to like to get the steam cleaned ones, but I just, I get either slightly crushed or rolled. A rolled oat. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But any any oat, well, I, I'll take whole oats a bit rather than uh, whatever I can get there. But I do like to put the oats, and some of the old timers used to like that. It seems to, there's, there's something about oats, even though, uh, there's an unknown growth factor in an oats too. I know for the sheep, there's nothing quite like oats for, a, for an animal feed. It, yeah. it, it, it surpasses the nutrient analysis. Actually, uh, found that when I was in school that it's, it, it's super. Yeah, it, 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 an analysis, and it always they found it does better. The animals do better on oats than than what it, they predict it was going to do. So when you're feeding them those rabbits that you're getting ready for the show, you mix the oats in with the yeah. pellets at about 15 percent. If you feed it too early, you know, oats, and 
you know, the, you, want the, you want the rabbit to grow out, but then you want it to hold that firm flesh. And oats, oats, oats helps keep the flesh firm. That's what I found yeah. too, yeah. So, it, yeah, okay. So how long would you be feeding oats before a show? Well, maybe uh, four or five weeks. Okay. And, uh, and just what they'll clean up. Uh, I, I, I only feed once a day if I was really, uh, lots. I'd maybe try feeding twice a day, but it just doesn't work for me on the farm. I just yeah. can't feed little enough each time, and I can't justify my time going down there. Yeah. When I have the sheep and the rabbits and the lawns and the field work and everything, you just, you, you can't do it all. If I just had the rabbits, it would be interesting what I would do. I don't know if I'd do any more or not. Maybe not. No, no you're shaking your head. You've tried that. No, I, I don't want to. Uh, you know, the rabbits, I, don't, I, want to, I want to do the best for them, but I don't want to become a nitpicker there either. I don't want to become so fussy that I, they're, you know, they're... Uh, but limit yeah. limit feeding is hard to get it right. Every rabbit is an individual, and the problem I always had, Bill, if I had to go away for a few days to get someone to cover oh, the bases. Yeah, they, they can't oh do it. You can't man, that, them to do it. no, but it that's the problem. Then you know you it's you have to be real committed to get those rabbits in condition. Yeah, for the show. yeah, yeah. I yeah, I I maybe uh, yeah uh, yeah it works. I don't know what to say about that. It's just. Uh, some of them just seem to condition on their own, no matter what you do. And some, some you have to work at it. I, I guess maybe from a breeding standpoint, you should, you shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't fuss and just pick the ones that condition on their own. Yeah, and maybe we'd be better off in the long run. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe. Who knows? Now, before we tour the rabbitry, Bill, uh, can you give us a little history about your sheep? I know you, you, you've had them longer than the rabbits. Yeah, the sheep. And, and you show them as well, and you yeah. judge them as well, don't you? Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, the uh, sheep, uh, see, they, we started, the guard houses had uh, sheep since 1902. There's one breed we have called Lincolns. And, uh, and I still have them today. I, I've had them since, uh, well, since 1902. Yeah, but I wasn't around then. And, but I but in get, the family. Yeah. I, did, I did get into Suffolk sheep in, in 1974, so I've got the two breeds out there now. Um, and uh, the Lincoln sheep, the, the one interesting thing about them is, you know, I've got the farm sold here now, so uh, I'm going to have to make a move to a smaller place. Likely the sheep will have to go. Uh, rabbits and chickens will likely stay. But it's hard with those sheep because I found out when I went over to England there, uh, in, in 2008, or 18, sorry, uh, to judge, I judged the long wool sheep over there. I got invited over because I have uh, my Lincoln background. And I found out I have the longest running, run, family, or uh, family run sheep in the world, Lincoln sheep in the world, yeah. I've been, uh, since 1902, a lot of people in England have kept, started long before that, of course, but the family hasn't been continuous. Of course, it's going to end with me because I'm a bachelor here, and, and that's fine. But it's hard to give something like that up. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and the rabbits or sheep or chickens, you always kind of want to, you want, you want to have a chance to produce something really good. Well, the sheep, maybe the best sheep, best animal I ever produced was a Lincoln ram named uh, uh, Guardhouse 51S in 1985. It was supreme champion at the Royal and went down to the States and won down at Louisville. And that ram, that ram really bred well. He put me on the map and he was a superior ram. Um, so I always have a fondness for that ram because he was so special. And sometimes when you're in a sheep or rabbit, you can, you can spend your whole life and never really produce what you call a stud ram or a stud rabbit. I know that sounds awful hard. My, my sister don't like hearing this because she says, oh, you've done well, but well, she doesn't get it. I'm talking about a super one that's just special. and uh, Exceptional. But he was, yeah, and he yeah. bred well, and I sold sons all over the States from him. So that was my biggest accomplishment, maybe, in, in breeding sheep. And the chickens, well, I always liked the silver-laced Wyandots, and I showed them all over the place, too, and uh, I enjoyed them. Do you have some now still? I still have some. We could show a picture down there. Okay, good. There's good. Black, uh, black lacing on the silver center. They're kind of pretty. 
Okay. Is there anything else you'd just like to add that I've maybe not covered yet, Bill, that you'd just like to say about the rabbits or? Well, uh, I don't know. I have, uh, not really, I don't think, no. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go to the barn and uh, see the rabbitry and have a walk around there. He's walking up to the barns here. Bill's got three barns that he uses for his rabbits. Three or is it four, Bill? Uh, the ones, the far one's a chicken barn. Far one's a chicken No barn. rabbits in there. So we'll go in the first one here? Yeah, the first one uh, is where my babies are all born. You'll see that there's, uh, they're, most, they're all wooden pens in here. You go ahead. And uh, so what do you keep here in the wooden pens, Bill? These are all the, the breeders and, and my stud bucks. Uh, mostly New Zealand whites. I do have a few Californians. Uh, I guess I'm old fashioned and because I, I still keep my does on these wooden pens with lots of bedding, lots of straw. And even with a nest box, I still let them just have the babies in the corners. I don't even uh, bother with nest boxes and uh, uh, it seems to work for me. So it gets, this, it's, it's a little warm in the summertime, but in the winter it's great. They have the comfort of the, and this building's insulated. Now part of the, the issue that I would see, like for a guy like me, is getting the hay and the straw bill, because yeah. they have these big bales now, yeah. and it's hard to find a barley straw. You would use barley straw. Do you use barley I straw? I try to get it, yeah. It's a softer straw. Yeah, or and, uh, I find it's hard to find the stuff. They don't well, do right. the small bales, but you're right. if you're making your own, that, well, that helps, it's, eh? It's true, and, and, and the fact that I have access to a, a large manure spreader, well, I park it when I clean them out, so I have lots of place to put the manure. There's, there's lots more to deal with, of course, because of the wooden pens. Uh, it just fits my style, because uh, I get busy on the farm, and I really haven't got time to play games with nest boxes, in and out. Sometimes if you have them on a wire and then you get, you're too late, guess what? Babies are in here, they're always, um, they're always able to do it. Do you, um, do you find, Bill, when they have them in the wood cage in the wintertime, do the kits get out of the, uh, out of the nest wandering around? Do they find their way back? Do you lose some that way in the well, winter? That doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. They, you know, they, they seem to, it's all on one level, so they, they're not going to drop, but they, I guess I, maybe I lose a few, but it doesn't seem to be too much of a problem for me. Like I find even in a large nest box in the winter, sometimes you'll get one that's on their own, they'll die. Oh yeah. They're not with the rest of the litter. And yeah. I'm just wondering, is that an issue in the big, well, the big I'm, cage? Well, I'm, one thing, if it's easy access for me, I open the door and if there's one out there, I get it back in pretty quick. I do check them twice a day, okay. uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, there's, there's some negative aspects, I guess, to it, but I, I just, uh, the biggest problem, actually, is, is when the babies are there, I have to put a board across the front here in order to... Uh, so they don't fall out when you yeah. open the door? Yeah, otherwise, yeah, because you, when you open the three at once there, like here's one here, this, this door's... Oh, yeah. A few little babies here <laughs> yeah but you know but you need something there just to hold it yeah uh, whereas the one below doesn't have it it doesn't have a litter no yeah. I had, but I just I can't pray that seems to do the job and and the one thing about the cage it opens wide so I have a big aluminum shovel there and you know, I guess because I'm a farmer I don't really uh, I don't really begrudge that kind of work I don't clean them out as often as they should maybe but maybe once every four weeks and just keep topping it up. And I don't think the germs actually, when they're in that kind of environment, I don't think it's as bad as some people think it should, would be. I think you're right. But, you know, once Too again- Too sterile is not good either, I think sometimes. <laughs> just my I, opinion, but- uh, well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a few Californians here. This is the doe here that uh, was uh, first prize senior doe at Columbus a couple of years ago in a class of, I don't know, 40, 55, I think it was. 
and she's got a litter of about five in there now. Awesome. I actually, I overfitted her. Like she was, when she won the senior doe class, she was heavily fitted. And that affects their breeding potential a bit. What do you mean by heavily fitted? Well, she was, she was loaded. And uh, I was first, fourth and fifth senior doe in a big class. And, and that was a great win, but they were loaded. Like they were, and it, it, I bred to them. Well, here's another one up here. She come around all right, but they just sometimes, uh, with that, with that fit early on, I should have, ideally, it would have been nice to breed them earlier. Too big, yeah. It's yeah. Just, this one come out of it all right. This one here is still, still working on it. And you have your spot that you can look them over and yeah, sort and them and weigh them. And, scale here. Yeah, and you have some trophies there from years gone by. There's a, that's a, that's a, New Zealand White that won at the Canadian National Exhibition in 1985. Wow. Uh, so who have you got there, Bill? This is uh, J1. That's his uh, sin number. That's a buck? <laughs> That's a buck, yeah. He was actually, uh, when he was uh, intermediate, he got best in show at Peter Terse's show. <laughs> he did. The famous Peter Tursa. He got and we had he had a utility show there, Californians and New Zealand and I remember that. Yeah, and Liz Voigt judged. He still looks good. And he, he was he always was a thick buck. Always had the width and he still has enough depth. Uh he's maybe dipping a little bit there, but he's he's showing his day. But he still has done when I take him take him to a show, he's still I think he got, he's got three reserve in shows at the last three shows. The two Barry shows and, uh, and um, Schomburg here just uh, three weeks ago he was reserve in show. Just turn him a bit so I can get the back end and just see how wide he is. A little bit more, yeah, just. Uh, he is wide. He weighs 11, 11 and a quarter pounds. That's a big buck. Oh, no, sorry, nine, uh, 10 and three quarters. Which is, uh, I'll forgive you. <laughs> Proof in the pudding here. See, technically, if he's, if he's over 11 pounds, he's supposed to be DQ'd, which is kind of crazy. But uh, because he's got the type. Gorgeous. Well, I would keep a rabbit like that oh, for yeah, breeding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is where they go in the summertime, where I get my show ones out of out here in the open. Lots of airflow here. Yeah. Can you go if a little I, further down? Yeah, thank you. If I was going to do it again, I'd like to just have them single tiered somewhere. The next stop, if I, when I move from the farm here. Uh, the double's all right, but uh, I, I, uh, I think single would be better if I can and you have dividers that are a plastic, a type of fiber yep. divider, aren't they? Yep, that seems to be good Keeps stuff. them from messing each other up. Yep. Yeah. And you don't have any out here. No, I've, I've been cutting back. Silver laced wine dots. These are uh, yearling rams. There's uh, three suffix in there and uh, uh, five, uh, five Lincoln rams. Can you put them out in a pasture from time to time too? Yeah, they're gonna, uh, I'm gonna put them out in the pasture here shortly, but right now they're just held here. So you have to, Give them bales of hay to nibble on. Yeah, yep. The, all the racket they're making. I don't. I don't need to keep so many rams, but we all. Some. Some when you're. You always do. The two different breeds here. The one more of a wool breed, and one more of a meat breed. You'll like the suffix the best. You would, yeah. But they're they're awful to deal with. Yeah. Bullhead, you gotta be strong. 
okay.